Okay, cheers and salutations. I think uh, there were a lot of people who were requesting us to check this video out due to the fact that we here at Americans Learn, well, at least me in particular, I am a former United States Marine Corps veteran, and there's something about Marines in which we take a lot of pride in, like any service branch has pride in, and that is the stories of its heroes and legends. And one legend in particular is Marine Corps sniper who served in Vietnam, Carlos Hathcock. And this is a video done by the Fat Electrician. So, folks, please do me a favor. Please support the original content creator. It's the right thing to do. It's the one thing to do. And I hope all of you will do that. So uh, he's done a lot of great work. I encourage all of you to please do the right thing. Do the one thing. Support the original content creator. Support the original content creator. It's, 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 I would appreciate it because this hits close to home. The Marine Corps. So without further ado, since I'm in charge of the ones and twos, let's get ready to hear the tale of a legend and enjoy this video in a three, a two, and an uno. This is my fifth attempt at making this video in the past two years. Portions of this story have been told and retold across books, newspaper articles, and the internet for decades. And with every retelling, more and more doubt gets cast upon this story's validity yes. because the events seem that unbelievable. Yes. And because of that, I felt that it was very important to not only be able to tell this story in its entirety, yes. but to be able to prove that it was not only plausible, but probable along the way. That being said, I've been waiting... The correct answer is all the stories are true. None of them are false. How, how dare you? You should have just gone along with it as is. After all, us Marines are merry gentlemen, after all. In two years to say this next part. <laughs> Today we're talking about the greatest sniper of all time, ladies and gentlemen, Carlos Norman Hathcock II, or as the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong came to call him, Long Tang, a.k.a. White Feather. Wait, wait, we gotta get the sponsorship in, then we can have the rest of the story uninterrupted. This video is brought to you by Ridge Wallet. Okay, look, here's the deal. They've sponsored the channel before. You guys already know it's a minimalist wallet that you can stick in your front pocket. That way you're not having this gigantic Gutenberg Bible-sized dad wallet sitting in your back pocket. So why am I bringing this up again? Well, because one, they're, they're paying me. I'm just gonna be honest with you. And two, reasonable. Two, there's never been a better time to upgrade your wallet because right now through September 13th, they're having their summer sweepstakes where they're going to be giving away a grand prize of the winner's choice of either a gold-plated Cybertruck, $100,000 in cash, or a $140,000 Hennessy Velociraptor. Now, I'm not allowed to... I'm just going to go for the cash, but maybe that's me. I'm going to tell you which one I would pick, but I can tell you I'm not taking the cash, and I definitely am not going with the one that reminds me of Laura Croft's personality. Don't you think you've seen enough? <laughs> hey, hey, show some respect to Laura Croft, okay? Back in the day, that meant something right there. If you know, you know. Huh? For every dollar you spend over at Ridge, you're going to get one entry regardless of the product. But some products are even worth more than that because if you buy the Cyber or the Hennessy model stuff, those are worth four times as many entries. And best of all, there's even a way to get entered for free. So go check that out. I'm going to have a link in the description and the pinned comment down below. Let's get back to the video. January 20th, 1942, Carlos Hathcock Jr. is born in Little Rock, Arkansas. Fast forward to early 1946, Carlos is approximately three years old and his father has just returned home from fighting in World War II. And with him, Carlos Hathcock Sr. brought home a gift for his adorable baby boy, a German Mauser, which... Ah. <laughs> That's a good present if you don't know, is the primary infantry weapon of the Nazis in World War II. Apparently, he had tactically acquired it after its previous owner had died suddenly. No, no. Gee. Hold on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, gee, Dad, how'd you get this? Well, that kindly old German, uh, dropped it. What's this red stuff? Oh, we had a raspberry party. See? Mm. <laughs> Suddenly. Yep, that's exactly what happened. Yep. So, you know, presumably, after rolling up and just seeing the rifle laying on the ground, he did what any American would do. He picked it up, he kind of admired it, and was like, huh, 
this would make a great gift for my toddler. So yeah. he plugged the barrel. He made it inoperable, at least, and then brought it back home and gave it to his kid. So now dad's home, and we've got young three-year-old Carlos Hathcock running around in the woods outside of Little Rock, Arkansas, with a de-weaponized German Mauser pretending that he's fighting Nazis and the Imperial Japanese, just like dad. Fast forward again to when Carlos Very is seven good. years old, and he sees his first John Wayne movie, where John Wayne is portraying a United States Marine. At this moment, Carlos Hathcock decides that he is going to be a Marine, too. Everything else in life, school, chores, all of it is just biding time until he turns seven. <clears throat> M-A-R-I-N-E-S. Hey, that's the way you spell success. 17 years old, he can get his parents' permission to go and join right. the Marine Corps. One year after that, Carlos's father re-enters the military to go fight in the Korean War, and the family is moved to Missouri, then they're moved to Tennessee. The father goes off, he fights, he comes back home, but when he comes back home, both of his parents have, they've always kind of had a drinking problem, but their drinking gets significantly worse, and so does their relationship. The next major formative event- That's unfortunate. Sometimes it happens, folks. Event in Carlos's life is at his 10th birthday when he is given his very first real gun, a J.C. Higgins bolt-action 22 caliber rifle. From that point on, Carlos basically lives out in the woods, shooting cans, squirrels, birds, anything he can. And while Carlos is out in the woods, his parents' relationship continues to deteriorate. And by the time that he is 12, his parents have gotten a divorce and Carlos is sent back to Arkansas to live with his grandmother in an unincorporated village known as Geyer. Unincorporated village basically just means that they're living out in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. Carlos's next oldest sibling is 10 years younger than him. There's no neighbor kids anywhere near his age for a 20 mile radius and grandma and grandpa are busy doing grandma and grandpa stuff. So Carlos spends the majority of his teenage years basically living out in the woods with his dog and his 22 caliber rifle, helping to put food on the family table because grandma and grandpa are struggling financially. So they are eating squirrels, birds, and rabbits, whatever Carlos is able to shoot. During this time, Carlos becomes an exceptional outdoorsman. His 22 caliber rifle does not have a very huge range, and if he wants to be able to kill something efficiently, he needs to be able to get as close as possible. He learns how to move through the woods quietly, sneaking up on highly alert prey. And he becomes such an exceptional marksman that he's able to shoot birds out of the air while they are flying with his 22 caliber rifle, which is impressive. And this goes on for years, and then at the age of 15, Carlos drops out of school and goes to work full-time doing concrete. He does that for two more years till he finally hits the age of 17, he then gets consent from his guardian to go and join the Marine Corps. So in 1959, welcome brother. And at the age of 17, Carlos Hathcock goes off to training to become a Marine and he absolutely crushes it. I mean, how could he not? He's been doing full-time manual labor for a couple of years. And the 10 years prior to that, he's basically been living in the woods by himself, learning how to become an expert marksman. Despite being the best shot out of any new recruit available, he continues to hone this skill. They have a mandatory amount of time and qualifications they have to meet in marksmanship. However, Carlos Hathcock also spends all of his free time out at the range continuing to work on this skill when nobody else does. He doesn't just want to be a good shot, he wants to be the best shot, and he wants to be able to do it from every single position the Marine Corps utilizes at the time. They do standing, prone, sitting, kneeling, and they have the infamous squat position at this point in time, also commonly referred to as the rice paddy prone, and Carlos practices all of them and masters all of them. It is at this point that Hathcock kick ass begins to develop what he calls his bubble, which is essentially his aura of concentration around taking a shot, where nothing in the world gets any attention other than his target and his crosshairs. One of his instructors once said, and I quote, an elephant could crap on Hathcock's head and unless the load blocked the sights, Carlos would never even notice. So Carlos is already just naturally immensely talented at marksmanship, but he's also completely obsessed with getting better. That's all this guy cares about. And it just reminds me of something one of my coaches used to say, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And I probably heard this coach say that 50 times over the course of a couple of years. And then finally, we had this new guy that raised his hand and said, but coach, what if talent does work hard? To which my coach replied, you should probably stay out of that motherfucker's way. And in the case of Carlos <laughs> Hathcock, that would prove to be correct. You know what? The God Emperor of Mankind blessed him. 
Carlos finishes training, gets MOS qualified as an 0331, a machine gunner, and then immediately gets sent over to Hawaii and stationed there because that's where the Marine Corps rifle team is. So Carlos goes over to Hawaii, reports for his new duty station, gets settled, gets signed up for every marksmanship competition they have scheduled, shows up to the very first one. It's a 600 yard event. Now Carlos is here because he's a great shot, but he's also the new guy. He just got out of training. All the big dogs are here. This is where the Marine Corps rifle team is at. Like he's not expected to do well in these competitions competitions at all. He is the newbie that they need to take under their wing and train, and he's the next generation of shooter, and this is going to be his first competition just to get his feet wet, is what everybody thinks is going to happen, and then Carlos wins the entire fucking thing. As he should. Pretty much immediately after winning this competition, he is given an official spot on the Marine Corps rifle team, meaning that this is more or less his full-time job now. Like, yes, he's a machine gunner, but his day-to-day -day job is going to be going and improving his marksmanship to be able to show off how great the marksmanship in the Marine Corps is, which is great for Carlos. It's basically his dream job. And on top of that, it's 1960. It's a time of peace. There's no prospects for war on the horizon, and there's really nothing else for a machine gunner to be doing. So the rifle team is a great spot for him. Carlos spends the next two years there, continuing to hone his skills, winning all kinds of competitions, and one of the people that he meets there that's also on the rifle team is a lieutenant by the name of Jim Land. And Jim Land has this dream that he wants to bring back sniper school and make it a permanent fixture in the United States Marine Corps. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Well done. Yeah, so if you don't know, in 1960, there's no snipers in the U.S. military. That's not a thing. Most people don't even know what that is or have ever even heard of it. Now, I can't speak for other countries, but in America, there always appears to be this desire from the higher ups in the chain of command to try to get rid of the scout snipers altogether, right? We had scout snipers during World War II. Right after World War II, they got rid of the school, got rid of the job, didn't exist anymore. Korean War broke out. Bring them back. Korean War ends. Get rid of them. And in my opinion, this is due to the simple fact that the role of the scout sniper both terrifies and makes the chain of command look dumb all at the same time. Because in modern times, how are all the high-ranking generals that are going to conveniently have a nice, cushy, multi-million dollar a year job at a DOD contractor going to be able to justify using an $800,000 Hellfire missile to take out one bad guy when they've got some fucking 20-year-old corn-fed kid from Omaha named Lance ah. Corporal Smith that's willing to crawl on his belly for three days and shoot that same guy in the face from 500 yards away with a bullet that costs 68 cents so the first thing this guy leave it up to the officers to screw it up snipers have going against them is that they're just too efficient right i mean it's hard to make billions and billions of dollars off of warfare when you've got these guys out there unaliving people off the dollar menu you guys are getting paid Back in the day, the reason for getting rid of sniper school after World War II and Korea was pretty much the same thing. It wasn't a gentlemanly, noble, honorable way of conducting warfare. It seems kind of cowardly to dress up like a bush and shoot your enemy when he can't even see you. No, it's not. It's called fighting dirty. That's how you should. And there's honor in that. Which is exactly the type of wannabe tough guy bullshit that somebody not putting their ass on the line would say. It's probably more along the lines of the high ranking officer realizes like, well, if I utilize snipers, my snipers are going to go shoot at their high ranking officers because obviously that's the whole point. But then the enemy is probably going to train snipers and then their snipers are going to come shoot me. Is he going to come in here? He's going to kick my ass. The entire Reasonable concept is just stupid and un-American, right? America didn't win its independence from Great Britain because we marched our happy asses out into an open field and stood there while they shot at us. Fuck nope. you, we're shooting at your ass from the tree line. Get off our lawn. The unofficial slogan of the United States military is if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Exactly for a reason, okay? You go to any grunt in any branch in the United States military and you give them the option of like, hey, if you fight like this, we'll write, he died like a gentleman on your tombstone. And if you fight like this, you get to go home to your kids. Guess which one he's fucking picking. So Need I say more? If you're not picking up what I put down, the long and short of it is basically snipers don't exist in 1960 because we allow people that don't have to do the job have an opinion on how the job needs to be done. That's why. 
But Jim Land has been studying up on this. He's been reading the old manuals that he could find. He's been talking to some of the older guys and he's like, this sniping thing sounds like it's pretty fucking important. Somebody should figure this out and preserve it because one day we might need it. So he figures out everything he can about it, gets all the information. He writes up a proposal to the chain of command that he wants to have the very first scout sniper school. It's two weeks long and he's going to teach it here in Hawaii. And the chain of command is like, I mean, you guys are the rifle team. All you do is go shoot guns all day anyways. If you want to do it while crawling around in the bushes, fucking go for it. I don't care. Get out of my office. So now with permission, Jim Land is going to take volunteers, the first of which is Carlos Hathcock, and they are going to go out into the jungles in Hawaii and figure out how to become snipers. Starting from scratch, this is going to be the first iteration of the now legendary Marine Corps Scout Sniper program. So they go out for two weeks, they train, they lay the groundwork for the Marine Corps Scout Sniper program. Obviously, Carlos Hathcock excels because he's an expert woodsman. He knows how to move and traverse terrain and be quiet the entire time. And then after the two weeks is over, that's pretty much it. Jim Land keeps teaching the course, but Carlos Hathcock is done. He was just a student. He's going to go back to the shooting team. More or less, he just got a pat on the back and add a boy and then a certificate that said that he was a scout sniper now, but the certificate doesn't really mean a whole lot because nobody knows what the fuck a scout sniper even is. So Carlos just kind of chalks it up to a cool life experience that he's thankful for, but he goes back to doing his competitive shooting in Hawaii. That goes on for another year. By 1962, he's getting moved over to North Carolina to a place called Cherry Point, which is weird because that's a Marine Corps air base and he's technically an infantryman as a machine gunner 0331 so they're not even going to have any work for him there regardless he's got a i'm gonna let y'all on a little secret sometimes sometimes the marine corps could do some stupid things and put people in areas where it's just like all right there you go what do you want me to do i don't know for those that know you know what i'm talking about but I go because he's got orders. So he moves to North Carolina. He shows up to the Cherry Point Air Base, reports to the commander's office, and the commander's like, okay, son, I'm just going to level with you. I don't have a use for a machine gunner. I don't even know how you ended up here. I... That's that's the story of everything in the Marine Corps. I don't know how you ended up here. It's It's got a gentlemanly charm to it. How would you feel about just being like general staff? Which basically translates to he's going to be the groundskeeper. He's going to be mowing the lawn, scrubbing the toilets, maintaining the base's facilities. Which wow. Carlos Hathcock is an absolute nightmare. He does not want to spend the next three to five years of his career being a glorified janitor for this. No. Base. He feels like he has just been punched directly in the gut. The minute yeah. those words left the commander's mouth. The commander, seeing this look of horror on Hathcock's face, starts laughing. He's like, son, relax. Your buddy Jim Land called me. He made sure that you came to this air base because because we have one of the best shooting teams in the country and you're going to be competing for us now. You son of a, a bitch. <laughs> to which Carlos, like huge relief, he gets to just continue shooting and training people how to shoot all day, every day. It's his passion in life. It's the perfect job for him. He gets to keep living the dream. But here's the thing. At this point in time, Carlos Hathcock is a private. And as a private, he's living in the barracks with a bunch of other Marines. And all the other Marines start to notice that Carlos is... He's a little bit different. Carlos isn't just into his job and enjoys shooting. This man is obsessed with shooting. He stays out at the range every night until it's too dark to keep shooting. And then he comes back to the barracks. He'll drink and smoke like a normal Marine, but he's not going out chasing women. He's not going to the bars. He's staying at the barracks with his rifle next to his bunk, practicing dry firing from all of the firing positions. And just to be clear, he's doing this for hours on end on a concrete floor, okay? Some of these firing positions, like the prone position or the rice paddy squat, are not fun to hold, and this guy is doing it for hours every single night. He's basically practicing death yoga while he's smoking and drinking. It's the most Seems reasonable. Marine Corps shit I've ever heard in my entire life. So after witnessing this go on every single day for months, the rest of the Marines in the barracks are like, okay, okay, we got to get this guy laid. From now on, your dick is my dick. I'm <laughs> getting you some pussy. So one of the Marines is dating a girl that's a teller at the local bank, and there's another girl at this very same bank that's single, so they manage to set Carlos Hathcock up on a blind date. He shows up to the bank, introduces himself. Hi, I'm Carlos Hathcock. Her name is Josephine. They go out on a date. They both fall in love immediately because Carlos Hathcock doesn't miss. Very next day, he's out. Of that's right. 
at the range all day he's training people getting training in that's his job the normal working day comes to an end and carlos does not stay on the range until sunset like he has every other day no private hathcock goes into town and buys a brand new car because he has to keep impressing joe and he needs that car to take her out on dates which is the most private in the military shit i've ever heard in my entire life every single private finishes training goes to their unit and then goes and buys a brand new v6 you don't do that Ask your chain of command first before you do something stupid. Mustang or Camaro to impress women. And he spends absolutely all of his money on this car. The only thing he has left in his budget is enough money to keep getting his hair cut, which he absolutely has to do anyways. But you know what? It was worth it because Carlos and Josephine ended up getting married. They moved in with one another. And now, well, now Josephine's the one that has to sit there and watch Carlos do dry firing drills on the living room floor every single night before bed. <laughs> what the hell? Are you out of your fucking mind? Relax, Lois. I was aiming for the mailbox. I'm just trying to make a point. Good morning, Lois. <laughs> and this goes on for years. In 1962, he ends up setting a record for the Marine Corps Long Range A course, scoring 248 out of 250 possible shots, a record that to this day has never been broken. In the fall of 1965, he would win silver in a national match competition, which is a huge deal. He would also be recognized as a distinguished marksman, which is essentially being granted the rank of Jedi as far as competition shooting goes. And then that very same year, Never trust the Jedi. He would win the Wimbledon Cup. <laughs> and no, not the tennis thing, okay? The Wimbledon Cup is awarded for whoever wins the 1,000-yard high-powered rifle marksmanship competition. And whoever does that is considered to kind of be the best rifle marksman on the planet at that point in time. And in 1965, it was Carlos Hathcock. White feather. A couple of months later, Carlos Hath Not White Claw. Hathcock, the best marksman on the planet, is on his way to Vietnam, so naturally the Marine Corps makes him guard the front gate to a base. No, I'm not kidding you. Okay, because you gotta remember, nobody understands what a sniper is at this point in time. Jim Land just created the course for it four years prior, and none of the tactics have been battle tested. So presumably, there's like maybe a couple hundred Marines that have passed the scout sniper course running around in the entire Marine Corps. Nobody understands what a sniper is. Nobody understands how to utilize them, when to use them, and what they're doing. So, when they're trying to figure out how, where to send Hathcock over in Vietnam, all they see is that he's an O331 machine gunner that has not been attached to an infantry unit and has not been training with a machine gun for the past five years, so they don't feel comfortable sending him into combat, so they just have him guard the front gate. I mean, I guess to be fair, it's probably the safest front gate in Vietnam. No bad guys getting within a thousand yards of it. And this goes on for the first four months that Carlos is in Vietnam. His That's gotta suck. Hey, guard duty. Nothing sucks more than that. Him being assigned as an MP guarding the front gate to a base. Carlos Hathcock absolutely hates it the entire time. But then Jim Land gets deployed to Vietnam and he has permission to round up a bunch of other scout snipers that have already went through his program over the course of the last five years and he gets to pull them aside into their own scout sniper platoon where they get to experiment, test, and refine all the methods that he has been teaching for the last five years. And obviously the first person on his list to grab up is his very first star pupil and gate guard Carlos Hathcock. Thank you! Well done. So they get this platoon of scout snipers together. They go out to what's going to be their new headquarters for the rest of the deployment. It's right outside of Da Nang called Hill 55. And right out of the gate, this entire operation is a good old fashioned military shit show, right? Because there hasn't been snipers in the Marine Corps since the Korean War. There's no doctrine. There's no instructions. There's no, here's how we operate. Here's what we do. They have to figure all that out and just wing it. And if that wasn't bad enough, because there hasn't been snipers in the Marine Corps since the Korean War, they don't have any sniper rifles in the Marine Corps. So they don't even have guns. They're just out there being snipers with M1 Grands and iron sights. Obviously that's not gonna work. So Jim Land just ends up getting a bunch of civilian hunting rifles with scopes sent over to Vietnam and giving those to the men. And Carlos Hathcock ends up with a Winchester Model 70 chambered in 30-06 with an 8X scope. Land that's pretty badass right there. And also somehow manages to get his guys match grade ammunition, which is like a higher quality, more accurate ammunition that you're going to want if you're shooting at long ranges. From there, they get the operation underway. They go out, they start conducting missions. They start developing the doctrine, figuring out what works and what doesn't, laying the groundwork for what is going to become modern sniping in the United States military. And then the chain of command chimes in with brilliant ideas. 
What could possibly go wrong when the officers get involved? Everything. 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 Still not really understanding what these guys are trying to do. And they're just like, oh, hey, well, since you're like experimenting and, you know, developing stuff or whatever over on Hill 55, what if we just start sending you new guys that haven't done the scout sniper program previously and also aren't professional marksmen? And then you can just, you know, train them how to be scout snipers in a live combat zone on the fly for funsies. Does that sound good for you? Don't really care what you think. Do it anyways. K. bye. That would be great. Okay. What could go wrong? Yeah. Okay, do you understand how absurd that is? It's like Nikola Tesla in his laboratory unlocking the secrets of alternating current electricity and random dudes like Steve and Kevin just keep showing up to the door with orders of like, hi, I'm supposed to get trained in the electricity stuff. Like, I'm still working on unlocking the secrets and figuring it out. I'll let you know when I'm done. Nope, can't do that. You got to teach me everything you know right now on the spot live. Let's go. So we've got the pioneers, the new guys, training the even newer guys as this goes along. So where's the office back at Division? In the office, baby. According to Jim Land, Carlos Hathcock was actually one of, if not the best instructors he had. Not only was he exceptional at instructing people at how to shoot, because that's been his job the entire time he's been in the Marine Corps, but mm -hmm. he also was very good at taking guys out on real life missions and putting their mental ability to the test, because he didn't really care how well you shot. He cared about how well you shot after laying in the prone position for two days. The mental game was the biggest factor in determining if somebody was cut out to be a sniper or if they weren't, and Carlos was extremely gifted at finding that out very quickly. In addition to teaching, Carlos is going out on absolutely every mission he can. He ends up becoming good friends with another sniper by the name of John Roland Burke, and he prefers to go out with him or Jim Land himself end up being the two guys that he goes out on missions with the most. And Hathcock preferred them because they were also exceptional scouts, which is what was most important to him because Hathcock preferred to get within a hundred yards of an enemy before taking a shot, just so it was a sure thing. And a lot of the other new guys just weren't good at moving quietly through the jungle and that prevented Hathcock from being able to do that. So if John Roland Burke and Jim Land weren't available, Hathcock would just go out by himself. And this is one of those parts I mentioned previously where Yo. people like to start casting doubt and criticism upon this story like, Buh! He must be lying because snipers always go out in pairs. They never go out by themselves. Buh. Okay, I would agree with that if I didn't have the context that the sniper that we're talking about was one of the very first modern Marine Corps scout snipers in U.S. history that was actively in the process of developing the doctrine that's going to shape that career field for the rest of fucking forever. So yeah, normally you'd be right. However, historical context is a thing and it's kind of important, okay? Yeah, exactly. I'm getting tired of doubting uh, people doubting the Marine Corps legends. They're true, all of them. Another thing that's true, you do not eat charms. If you get them in your MRE, you throw them away. They're cursed. Don't eat them. As soon as you have them in your hand, you yeet that thing away from you as far as you can. Charms are bad. They're not good. They're evil. And it's a test. Charms are cursed. They're cursed. I know, okay? Because some dumb idiot, we had some dumb, we had a moron eat some charms. And I know I paused as, as, as he's making that face, but it's true. And you know what happened? A huge thunderstorm hit us because somebody wanted to eat charms. You don't eat them. Another thing that's true, Mr. Rogers was a scout sniper too. <laughs> Why do you think he's wearing those sweaters? To cover up the tattoos of all his kills. Am I lying? I would never lie to you. Never. Hey, moving. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, friends. Hang on. So Carlos Hathcock and the rest of the entire Scout Sniper Platoon start racking up an unprecedented amount of kills because they fight different than the rest of the military, right? The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army, they run into Americans. They're like, oh, they're a thousand yards away. They're 800 yards away. We're fine. And normally they are fine, except for when they run into these guys, then they have the a mind blowing issue. So Jim Land is sending up reports like, hey, my platoon has 14 confirmed kills this week. And the chain of command is like, what? Whoa, hold on. 
That's like more confirmed kills than an entire infantry battalion is getting at this point in time. And you got that from one platoon sized element. That's not even possible. What What is going on over there? So he kind of explains how they're operating, what they're testing. You know, they've got a couple dudes that are doing one man operations. They're doing some two man operations. They're experimenting with three man operations and the higher ups in the chain of command are like, I, I don't believe you. You know, these these two or three or one guys could just be lying and having a gentleman's agreement to pad their stats. I'm not going to trust this. The only way that we're going to recognize confirmed kills from this unit is if a commanding officer themselves witnesses it, which is absolutely an insane criteria, right? Especially with how a sniper operates, because now the only way that you're going to be able to get a confirmed kill is if Jim Land or another officer goes out on a mission with you or if you're up on the hill performing <laughs> overwatch duty. <laughs> and there's an officer also performing overwatch duty with you which actually ends up being how most of these guys got their confirmed kills and all the kills they got when they went out on missions didn't actually count because obviously they weren't always able to take an officer out on a sniper mission with them so those kills were never able to be confirmed and weren't counted so it's kind of a silly standard but carlos didn't care at all he didn't care about the stats he didn't care about the glory even later in life when he was asked in interviews how many kills he thought he had he genuinely had no idea he could estimate a rough range and that was about it hathcock didn't take pride in killing the enemy he took pride in the fact that he was the one being put in the dangerous situations in the first place because he truly believed that he was the best man for the job and if he didn't go they were going to send someone else out and if that person got hurt because they weren't as good as he was that was going to be on him because of this carlos was going out on every single mission that he possibly could according to jim land it was impossible to keep carlos from going out it was even tougher to reel him back in the man was harder than woodpecker lips because of this hathcock starts racking up a as he should be ton of kills some of them are confirmed when he's going out with jim land some of them are confirmed when he's on hill 55 and a ton of them aren't confirmed when he's going out by himself or with john burke however carlos genuinely doesn't care he's just going to work somewhere early on in this process he stumbles across a white feather he's not exactly sure what kind of bird it came from but he thinks it probably came from a chicken so he picks it up sticks it in his boonie cap and he leaves it there for the rest of the time he's in vietnam okay that's absolutely crazy for a sniper to do white is not a very common color inside the jungles of vietnam and having that color on him is going to stick out like a sore thumb while he's trying to wear his camouflage and everything else and go unnoticed. And when yeah. he was asked why he did it, he said he was basically taunting the enemy. Like, here I am come get me he was rubbing it in their face that he was the best and he knew it now on one hand i feel like this seems incredibly reckless and uncharacteristically arrogant for him but on the other hand I think he did it on purpose and it lines up with his code of ethics perfectly. I think he did this on purpose to protect the guy that went out with him, whether that was Jim Land or John Burke or anybody else, because he got them in the situation where he took them out on this incredibly dangerous mission that he volunteered for because he was the best. And I think he felt that if another enemy sniper or an enemy spotted them first, that feather would mean that they saw him first and shot him and gave his partner a chance to get away. I think the single quality that separates a boy from a man is when you make somebody else's well-being your personal responsibility. Carlos Hathcock wasn't just a man, he was the man because he made absolutely everyone's well-being his personal responsibility. Right on. As time passes and Carlos continues to rack up more and more kills, the enemy becomes more and more aware that there's a hotshot sniper out there always wearing a white feather and they start calling him Long Tang or White Feather. And as Carlos's reputation grows both with the enemy, the scout sniper platoon, and his chain of command, so does his experience. And with that experience, he starts to develop his doctrine, his standards, his operating procedures, and how he does things. He now realizes that he for sure operates best in a pair, and his number one right-hand man is John Burke, that he wants out there with him on every single mission possible. He also figures out that the best way to go out onto a mission is not to be inserted by helicopter with his pair, but to link up with another local infantry unit and go out with their entire platoon and then him and his spotter will peel off from that platoon and then go out on their one two three four five six day mission by themselves but that is the best way to be inserted and go unnoticed very clever i did not know that he also creates the rule that a sniper fires from a position three times, no more, and then he moves to another position. But on one occasion, he would violate that rule. At first, it wasn't any different from what had become his new norm for a mission. Him and John Burke linked up with a different infantry company, went out with a platoon-sized element on their patrol, 
and at some random point that they picked themselves, they peeled off and went off just the two of them to go do their sniper thing. And while they're going out, they had planned to go out and stock for six days. They brought just enough food and just enough water for that, and that's it. Hathcock always packed light. He only brought whatever he could fit in his pockets. He never went out with a rucksack or a bag of any kind. They're a couple hours into this patrol or this stock, and they come across this great overlook position overlooking thousands of yards of rice paddies and right down the middle of it there's this levee where there's a ton of water to make it through so they post up right on the wood line with rice paddies then this levee and then more rice paddies on the other side it's perfect because if the enemy is on the other side of that levee they're going to be able to engage the enemy and the enemy is going to have to try to make their way through all that water in the levee and they can just start picking them off one by one or they can use that time to get out of there so that's what they do they get their hide set up and they just start watching and waiting and hours pass and hours pass and finally that evening sure enough the hamburgers show up the cornerstone of any nutritious breakfast yeah, that's what Carlos Hathcock calls the enemy. According to him, there was only actually one enemy in Vietnam that he was fighting, and his name was Homer Hamburger. I have no fucking idea why, but I thought it was funny. So, 150 okay. Homer Hamburgers come dilly-dallying through the rice paddies. These guys are like a thousand yards away on the other side of the levee, but they're coming towards them. So, they keep letting them come closer, come closer, come closer, and right as they're about to get up on the levee, they can really start seeing them. They're about five to 600 yards away, which is perfect distance for Carlos to basically have 100% accuracy. I mean, he's the best shot at 1,000 yards in the world. 500 yards for him is a walk in the park. Granted, nothing's actually for sure. It's never 100%. It's definitely not fish in a barrel, but it is quite literally Homer hamburgers and a rice patty, which is close enough. So as this entire company comes up to this levee, Hathcock whispers over to John Burke with his M14, hey, you're going to take out the office officer in the front i'm gonna take out the officer in the back so that's what they do they both fire they both take out their officer that they were aiming for i'll fire first i want you two to start with the officers and work your way down this is such a good movie and if you've seen the extended edition it's even better So now there's like 147 Homer hamburgers looking around like, oh shit, what do we do? And the third and final officer takes off running. Believe it or not, it's pretty hard to run in a rice paddy and you can't run very fast, but he also didn't have to run very far. So at least on the bright side, he didn't die tired. So at this point, Carlos has shot twice. John Burke has shot once. That's three shots from one location. They got a bounce. But for some reason, Carlos is like, hold on, let's, let's wait a second. Because as he's watching this like 147 dudes, they're just standing there they don't know what to do they just bunker down out in the open in the middle of this field and don't do anything so carlos is like i mean i mean shooting fish in a barrel I know we're supposed to move after three, but I guess we can just sit here and pick them off until they do something. Now, if you're an American, this seems weird to us because in the American military, if you take out the officer, like, congratulations, you've just taken the regulator off the ass whooping machine. Now you've got a bunch of pissed off grunts that are looking to get creative and you're about to find out the hard way. It's never a war crime the first time. But in a bunch of other militaries, especially historically, the further we go back in time, they aren't trained to improvise and win anyways. They're trained to hunker down and await for further orders before they do anything. And that's what these guys did. And apparently these guys didn't have a radio with them because the orders never came because they just kept <laughs> sitting there and Carlos just kept picking them off one after one after one. In his own words, every time one of them would peek up their head, they'd lose their haircut. Now at this point, Carlos considers calling in artillery because he does have a radio and he does have artillery waiting on standby, but he thinks that that's gonna play into their favor because if he fires artillery, they're in a rice paddy. So those artillery shells are gonna be landing into the water of the rice paddy, drastically decreasing their effectiveness. And then as soon as the first shell lands, all the guys can call, you know, incoming, dive into the water of the rice paddy, ride out the volley, get up, run. They do that two or three times, they're home free. So he's just gonna keep them pinned down and he does it all day long until nightfall. So when the sun goes down, Carlos finally calls in for artillery, but it's not normal artillery. He calls in for star clusters and just lights up the sky over this rice paddy so that he can see what's going on and keep them pinned down all night long. Once it became apparent that they understood that they were going to be pinned down all night long, Carlos and John Burke took this opportunity to move to a different location. Next morning, first light, the hamburgers have mustered up the courage and come up with a plan that they are going to try to directly assault Carlos Hathcock or at least his general direction by. <laughs> ah, this should be glorious to witness. 
running through a levee and about five to six hundred yards of rice paddies and surely some of them will make it there. Yeah, that plan didn't last very long. They decided that was a horrible plan right around the time Carlos and John had to reload. So they hunker back down pretty much in the same exact spot, not knowing what to do. They just start like randomly firing at where they think Carlos and John are from 600 yards away with their AK-47. So it's not very effective fire, even if they were shooting where Carlos and John were, but they're not because they're shooting at their old spot that they had yesterday. From here, Carlos just goes back to keeping them pinned down, just playing whack-a-homer. Every time one pops up, they lose their haircut they know that they can't move and they're stuck there and Carlos is perfectly content with just letting them sit there and bake in the sun all day long because the more dehydrated and tired they get the less likely it's going to be that they're going to get away he has basically turned this into his very own miniature war of attrition night comes they light up the sky again all night long keeps them pinned down the next day same exact thing happens keeps them pinned down night comes again light it up all night long. Every day these guys are baking in the sun and every night John Burke is radioing back to the artillery, getting them more and more dialed in. And this goes on for five days straight. And by the end of the fifth day, Carlos and John are about out of water. They're completely out of food. They're both tired. They haven't slept much. Carlos figures these guys are as tired as they're absolutely gonna get. They're not gonna be able to run very fast through this rice paddy. They're definitely not making it through that levee to get me in time if I try to slip away. And on top of that, the artillery boys should have this pretty well dialed in. So he he calls in artillery and they level the entire rice paddy. <laughs> Fun with rice paddies. With with your host, Carlos Hascock. Hey folks, today we're gonna learn how to put meat in your rice. <laughs> Have fun cooking. Him and John make their way back to Hill 55. Oh, I think that's from the scene Sniper 2. If, if, not Sniper 2, but the, the first one, Sniper. They actually did a reenactment. I, I've heard this story about Cobra. Well, Cobra got skinned. I once was a man. A man! If, if you got that G.I. Joe reference, I love you. So at this point, Carlos and the entire scout sniper experiment on Hill 55 is proving to be extremely effective and word is spreading throughout the Marine Corps and the local military operating area and they have gotten the nickname Murder Inc. So some press officer in a stroke of genius, I assume, says to himself, wow, there's this new experimental type of unit being extremely successful by being sneaky and unseen and the enemy doesn't know about them. I should write a newspaper article about them to let everybody back home know how effective these guys are. So now Jim Land, Carlos, and the rest of Hill 55 are all pissed off. You know, nothing a sniper enjoys more than when you shine a fucking spotlight on them. Mainly, Ho Chi Minh puts a bounty on both Jim Land... <laughs> oh, look at that picture. <laughs> you know, hey, listen, I shouldn't be laughing because probably the ghost of Carlos Hascock will find, uh, find me in Chicago and pop me but it is funny and and carlos hathcock's head and sends his very best sniper to go collect those bounties a guy by the name of cobra but carlos doesn't know that for sure that's just the word on the street until one day there's a young marine staff sergeant passing by carlos's tent and he stops to have a conversation with somebody right by the door of carlos's tent and he gets shot by an enemy sniper. Carlos runs out of the tent, sees what happened. He immediately puts together, this enemy sniper's probably been watching him for days, and he knew that that was Carlos's tent, and he saw that that NCO was about the same size, same build as him. The enemy sniper thought that he'd just killed Whitefeather. And Carlos Hathcock is absolutely furious. He grabs his rifle, he grabs John Burke, and they head off in the direction that that shot came from, looking for this enemy sniper. They're proceeding with caution, looking for an enemy sniper, stalking their way up there the entire time. So it takes a long time, but they finally work their way down over to the next hill and start working their way up and they end up finding this sniper's hide. As they're climbing this hill, it started to level out a little bit and then it dipped back down into this tiny little creek waterway and then it started going right back up. The creek wasn't even visible unless you were literally right on top of it. It was the perfect spot for a sniper to be. And the little tiny creek was perfect to slip down into and make a perfect clean covered getaway and go completely unnoticed. So Carlos goes, you know, that's exactly what I would do. So he starts following this waterway to 
see where it leads and they're following it and they're following it and sure enough they come up and on the other side of this little waterway is the biggest muddiest most intentional looking footprints on the fucking planet Carlos immediately knows that if he follows those footprints, he is going to be walking face first into a trap because that sniper realizes that he had just fired upon an entire hilltop full of snipers and surely one of them is going to come after him after he had just killed the infamous white feather. So whatever is on the other side of those footprints is handcrafted by a sniper to kill another sniper. Carlos is looking at the footprints, weighing his options. He could call in artillery and just level the entire side of the mountain from there on out, but that wouldn't be a guarantee and he needs to make sure because this guy is too dangerous. The problem is, is this hasn't really been done before, okay? This sniper platoon that's experimental and is paving the way for sniper warfare hasn't run into this issue where they have to go toe to toe with a near peer and they have the upper hand. Carlos is kind of nervous. This sniper's good. He's done everything the exact same way that Carlos would have done it. Later in his life, he was interviewed about this and the interviewer asked him if he was scared to which Carlos replied, I was never scared. But at this point, I was very, very alert. At this point, keep your head on a swivel. You can't be scared. Fear is a good weapon. But then it's time to boot up and suit up and fight. Carlos says, this guy's good, but he's not better than me. There's no way. He then proceeds to don his plot armor and him and John Burke walk face first into a trap. So they're following this guy's trail. It's so obvious it's got to be intentional. And they come up onto this clearing and off in the distance, they see the most obvious tiny little one man campsite on the face of the planet. There's no way a sniper this good is being this obvious. So Carlos is just frozen, trying to figure out what is going on and what this guy's thinking so that he can counter it. He's trying to be one step of the enemy, knowing that the enemy is already one step ahead of him. So he just asks himself, what would he be doing in this situation? And he comes to the conclusion that the enemy sniper is probably expecting whoever's following him to come up onto that campsite to investigate, meaning that that enemy sniper has a hide somewhere with a perfect shot directly at that campsite. So Carlos reevaluates everything, deciding where he would pick the perfect shot if he had to shoot at somebody at that little campsite and he finds it. So Carlos and John start maneuvering out and around so that they can get a perfect shot at where they think this sniper is going to be set up. It takes them a while. They're proceeding with a lot of caution. They're moving super slow, but they end up making it there and they start scanning the entire area where they think that enemy sniper might be looking for a very well concealed enemy. John Burke using his binoculars and Carlos using the scope on his rifle. They're scanning, they're scanning, they're looking for this guy and time passes, time passes. They keep looking, they keep looking and suddenly there's a gunshot and Carlos's heart falls into his stomach. Time stops. He doesn't know if he's hit or worse, if John got hit and maybe his overconfidence walking face first into a trap just got his best friend killed. And then John Burke says the last thing that Carlos ever wanted to hear, I'm hit. And as he says that, Carlos feels warm liquid hitting up against his leg from John Burke's direction. As he looks down and sees water soaking into his pants and he looks over John Burke's canteen had just gotten shot off of his hip and John was fine. Whoa! Absolutely relieved. Oh, talk about a getting hit, but not getting hit. Tells John Burke, it's just your canteen. Get up. We got to go. They break go. contact. Then they enter their stock. The only way out of this now is to kill him first and they don't know where he's at. Hopefully he doesn't know where they're at either. But they do kind of know where that initial shot came from, so they start making their way there through this irregular route, stalking along the way, trying to find this guy. And they're stalking, they're stalking. It takes them forever, but they finally get to where this guy took the shot, and they find his hide. Again, it's a perfect textbook hide, exactly what Carlos would have done. And Carlos is looking around, trying to figure out where the hell this guy went. And then Carlos looks down to where they were, and he sees a glint. And they hunker down and he asks John Burke, did you just see that? And John's like, yeah, but that it could have been a moth. It could have been anything. And he's like, yeah, but that's exactly where we were. And Carl. Ah, that movie, by the way. See that. And John's like. This is a very good film. I prefer the first one. The other two sequels. Meh. Yeah, but that it could have been a moth. It could have been anything. And he's like, yeah, but that's exactly where we were. And Carlos realizes maybe this guy did the exact same that Carlos had just done. He had went to where the enemy was last. And then Carlos realizes that the sun is now on his back. And in his prior position, the sun was in his face. And then he realizes that John Burke's canteen was metallic on top. And maybe Cobra saw the glint off of his canteen. 
and that's why he took that shot. Carlos doesn't miss, but Cobra didn't miss either. He just picked a bad target. Then Carlos sees the glint again, and he just fires instinctively right out of the gate. And again, time stops. John Burt can't believe that he took that shot. Maybe it was a moth. Hell, maybe it was Cobra, and he has a canteen too. At least then they'll be even, and they wait. It feels like forever, but it's only like a second. And out of the shadows of where this glint was, a rifle barrel comes into the sunlight, and they see it as... Hathcock reloads and gets ready to make a secondary shot. The barrel falls to the ground. Cobra falls on top of it, sliding down the hill a little under this awkward resting position. They wait, they watch. Carlos is ready to make this follow-up shot, but this guy's not moving. So they finally get up. They make their way over to his body. As they approach him, John Burke realizes that Carlos has shot directly through the enemy's scope, not even touching the sides of the tube. At this point, Carlos immediately realizes for that to happen, Cobra had to have been looking directly at him as well. Not John Burke, not somewhere else. The only way that shot was possible was for both of them to be looking right at each other at the exact same moment, and Carlos was just quicker to pull the trigger. And maybe, just maybe, the only reason that Cobra saw Carlos first and not John Burke was because of a chicken feather. Carlos actually ends up deciding that he's going to take Cobra's rifle with him. He brings it back to the base, and it's some- A glorious victory point during his deployment it ends up getting stolen and he can't prove that he made this shot yo oh, i'd be so pissed Puh, that's because it's all complete no nah, no nah, hold on i, I am i'm not a scu if i was carlos i'd be pissed but anyways i was guys uh, what do you oh look what i did you know what i'm willing to bet it was some scumbag lieutenant there there i said it BS, he made it up. He never made that shot. Even Somebody stole it. Even the great Mythbusters couldn't recreate this shot, and they tried repeatedly. The Mythbusters. You know, they could bust this. How does that sound, Mythbusters? How does that sound? Mythbusters. I think they did that. They got to the Huh. Yeah, people have tried to recreate this shot. To the best of my knowledge, nobody's actually been successful at doing it, and it's probably because nobody's put forward a good effort. Even Mythbusters, with the Discovery Channel budget, managed to mess this up to the degree that it's atrocious. Okay, the first time they tried it, they shot it at a modern scope. Obviously not going to work right out of the gate. It's doomed for failure because a modern scope has about 10 times as much shit inside of it, and there's no way you're going to be able to penetrate through it. Then, they realized that they were shooting at a modern scope, so they went, they got a Mosin Nagant period accurate scope, which is what Cobra would have had, and he should be able to penetrate through that scope way easier. Had they not been shooting at it with a 308 fucking hollow point round, okay? If you don't know, a hollow point round is designed so it immediately expands and dumps all of its energy on impact, okay? You're trying to penetrate through something. Why would you fire a round designed to expand and dump its energy? If I wanted to stab a motherfucker at a skating rink, do you think I'd have better success with an icicle or a snowball? Then after that, they're like, oh, well, you know what? We should actually try shooting at it with a 30 6 round, which is exactly what Hathcock would have been shooting. But the only gun that we can afford that's chambered in 30 6 on our Discovery Channel budget is some old M1 Grand, and we're also not going to put full metal jacket, regular plain old 30 6 rounds in it. We're going to use an armor piercing round, so it's obviously going to work, and it's also going to cast doubt on the entire thing because there's a 0% chance that a sniper in Vietnam had access to armor armor piercing ammunition. Okay, all you have to do to recreate this shot the right way so we can know for sure if this is even possible is get a Winchester Model 70, get a 30-06 full metal jacket round, and get a 3X Mosin Nagant scope and shoot it through the scope and see what happens. And to the best of my knowledge, it's never, ever been done. Until now. For this, I teamed up with my Awesome. If you guys want us to check out this video, let us know. Friend Nick Johnson over from the PewView channel. He's the best shot I know. If I know anybody that can get this done, it's going to be him. But we didn't want to just capture this on camera. We're potentially proving history if we can get this done. We wanted to capture this on camera to the best quality that technology currently allows. And for that, we called up my other friends, Adam and Bryce from the Ballistic High Speed channel, and they drove up from Indiana with their fancy ass cameras, and we captured this shot at 100,000 frames per second. And Nick Johnson managed to do it on the first try. Not only did the bullet manage to penetrate all the way through the scope and into the head yeah. without touching oh. the sides, just like Hathcock said, it also managed to push a significant amount of the internals of the scope as well as powdered glass directly uh. into the brain as well. 
absolutely would have been fatal. We actually captured more angles of this shot and a bunch of more footage as to how we set everything up and how we got it done. And that's all going to be put together into a long form video over on PewView's channel. And he should be releasing it the same exact day that I released this. So after this video, you can go check. That's awesome. Check his video out. And then hopefully after that, you'll go check out Adam and Bryce over at Ballistic High Speed. Their entire channel is stuff just like this. So yeah, if a bunch of random dudes can come together on an afternoon in the middle of a cornfield and recreate this shot on the first try, not only is it plausible, it's absolutely probable that Carlos Hathcock, the winner of the Wimbledon Cup and one of the greatest snipers ever, managed to do it in real life. Also, not trying. I never doubted. I believed. Because the Marines always tell the truth. Just remember, the only other person who came up runner-up to Carlos Hascock is good old Mr. Ryan. Okay, that story's fake. <laughs> but perhaps in an alternate dimension, Mr. Rogers was a sniper. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Trying to brag or toot my own horn too much, but I only bothered tracking down and buying one Mosin Nagant scope because I was that confident we were going to get this done on the very first try. Mm -mm. Who's calling? Yeah, babe. What are all these telescopes doing on my counter? I just, just take them to Kohl's and return them. I don't, I don't need them anymore. Yeah, you have horrible timing. Love you. Okay. Bye. Aww. So for Carlos's next adventure, it's it's not really an adventure. He ends up getting stuck on Hill 55 doing a bunch of Overwatch duty. Basically, he's up on top of Hill 55, which is kind of right by the Ho Chi Minh Trail. If enemies walk by, he shoots at them. The problem is by this point, Hill 55 has been occupied by snipers for months and the Viet Cong have kind of figured out that that particular hill is a little bit spicier than the other ones and they can put accurate fire out a lot further than most other hills could. So they just stay extra far away from it, which, you know, to be fair, brilliant plan. That's exactly what I would do. So Overwatch duty, kind of boring. Carlos Hathcock is just kind of sitting up there. He can see these bad guys way off in the distance, right? They're on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They're smuggling stuff. They're doing recon on the hill, whatever they're up to. He just doesn't have a gun that's both accurate and powerful enough to reach out there and do something about it. So then one day, a couple of CBs show up and they're building something for Hill 55. And Carlos goes over to the CBs because, I mean, let's face it, the CBs can build just about anything with virtually nothing. And he's like, hey, I need you guys to build me a mount for an M250 Cal so I can just pop the scope off of my Winchester throw it on the 50 cal, zero it, and then I have a longer ranged weapon for when I'm on overwatch duty on top of the hill. And the CBs are like, sure, no problem. Here you go. Made it for him. Right That's just beautiful. Look at that. Right away. So now every time Carlos shows up to overwatch, he pops a scope off of his Winchester, mounts it onto the M250 cal, and then he just has a zero it to the 50 cal. And he does that by shooting at a rock 2,500 yards away. And he knows he's zeroed enough when he can hit the same rock three times. Don't get me wrong. It's it's a big ass rock. It's more like a boulder. And just to be clear, so okay. we're on the same page, the 50 cal is definitely more accurate with a scope, but it's also definitely not a precision sniper rifle by any means. When you're shooting out to crazy distances like 2,500 yards, the quality of the gun and the quality of the ammunition really start to matter. If I did the math right, a 50 caliber BMG round traveling out of an M250 caliber Maj Maj Deuce at 2,500 yards, even if Carlos shot perfect, that round could still wind up anywhere within a six foot diameter of where he was actually aiming. And none of that would be on him. It's literally just the variability between the weapons platform and the ammunition. Obviously, Carlos Hathcock knows this, but it's still going to be a lot of fun because he was just sitting up there bored, unable to do anything. And now he's at least going to be able to scare the shit out of people. So that's what happens. Every time Carlos shows up for Overwatch duty, he pops the scope off of his Winchester, mounts it onto the M250 caliber, and then he zeroes it on a boulder 2,500 yards away just to get it as close as humanly possible. Then one day on Overwatch duty, Hathcock's just scanning the perimeter, doing his normal thing, and he, he stops cold in his tracks. He's like, there's no way this is happening. And he motions over. LT, get over here. Get on the spotting scope. Look at this. LT gets on the spotting scope. He's like, okay, what am I looking at? And he's like, you see that dude, the scout with the binoculars, 2,500 yards out there, not seeing him. He's like, he's literally sitting on a rock. Which rock is he sitting on? The one with all the bullet marks on it that I use to zero this gun every day is the rock that he's sitting on. The misfortune of this man is palpable. The LT sees him and is like, holy shit. Carlos Hathcock fires. Okay, here's the thing with this. 
Shooting an M250 cal at 2,500 yards, if I did this math right, that's gonna take like 2.8 seconds for that round to get there, okay? That's ah. almost three whole Mississippi. Three Mississippi after firing a round is like three minutes in the bedroom. It's basically an eternity. As they're watching in their scopes, the milliseconds are going by like hours. And this dude way out there on the rock apparently got done looking at whatever he was looking at and goes to stand up. At this point, Carlos is like, I missed. There's no way I'm going to hit this. And as soon as he stands up completely, he catches this round directly in the head. Deep. Oh, well, sucks to be that guy. Field. Pilar racing back, getting to the wall. He jumps and he makes the catch. That was awesome. And this is actually the world record for the longest distance confirmed kill in combat from 1967 until it was broken in 2002. It took almost 40 years of technological advancement and a sniper shooting an actual big ass hopped up modern day sniper rifle and he only beat Carlos Hathcock's record by 30 yards. Now, to be completely fair, as I've kind of already explained, there was a fair amount of luck involved in him actually landing this shot, and he is the first person to actually admit that in his interviews. However, getting lucky is also kind of a skill, and Carlos Hathcock just doesn't miss. And if he hadn't stood up, I'd went over his head. <laughs> but, as luck would have it, he stood up. He caught that chunk of lead. Carlos's stint doing overwatch duty on Hill 55 would finally be broken when the Viet Cong sent out a group of counter snipers to attack Hill 55 and Carlos in particular. As they continued to have interactions with this counter sniper unit, the snipers on Hill 55 came to figure out that there was about five men being led by a highly trained female counter sniper known as Apache. Huh! There was no women in combat roles during Vietnam and they definitely would have been in a role as prestigious as a leader of a sniper crew. Huh! Maybe let's give it the two second Google test. Women in Viet Cong. Several. Yes, there were women in the Viet Cong. A million Vietnamese women served in the military and in the militias during the war, both for the North and the South of Vietnam. So women absolutely did find their way into combat during the Vietnam War. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were a highly trained sniper, so let's examine that more closely. The Vietnam War is essentially America versus guerrilla fighters known as the Viet Cong, and the Viet Cong are being backed by the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, and the North Vietnamese Army is being backed by the USSR. So since the USSR is advising them, training them, and supplying them, the question becomes Comes, would the USSR ever consider training and utilizing female snipers? Not only would they, they're literally the most famous people on the planet for doing it. In 1942, the USSR started a female-only sniper school because they believed that females... Ex don't, hey, hey, don't forget the night witches. The night witches. Yes, they control the sky and put fear in the Third Reich excelled at the job of being a sniper. They believe that women were exceptionally good at this because people always underestimate women and don't see them as a threat. They were easier to conceal because they had smaller stature. They exhibited a greater pain tolerance. They were more patient and they were easier to teach because they didn't have as big of an ego. And you know what? There's a solid argument they were right because a lot of the women that came out of that program ended up being some of the most successful snipers in human history. Literally the lady of death, Ludmilla Pavlyshenko, who has 309 confirmed kills came out of this program. Program. And there's a ton more that have kill counts in the two and even three digit range. You're probably thinking, what? This is crazy. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Apache and her crew decide that the best way to try to take out the snipers on Hill 55 is to go around to the local villages capturing South Vietnamese that they believe are aiding the Americans on Hill 55. And they capture them and then at night they get them within earshot of the hill and torture them to death so that the Marines can hear their screams at night. And this is going on every night for like two weeks straight. The Marines are pissed, they're distraught, they don't know what to do because they know it's a trap. Okay, she has her whole crew set up with sniper positions, trained on her, and if they go in and find her and track her down, they're gonna be walking face first into a trap. There's literally nothing they can do because she only comes out and does this at night. And they never know where she's gonna be doing it because she does it in a different spot every single night. The only thing the Marines can do is go out the next morning, find the remains of her latest victim, and clean that up. And one day, Carlos is on the detail to go out and collect those remains and get everything taken care of, but today, it wasn't a North Vietnamese soldier or somebody helping out the Americans. 
it was a marine seeing the remains of this young marine that's been tortured to death carlos has never been so mad in his entire life he goes back to hill 55 gets his shit gets ready goes to jim land tells him i'm gonna go kill this bitch to which jim land says i'm regulate coming with you and they go out together so carlos hathcock and jim land set out to stalk apache they have no idea where she's going to be next but they do know where she's been most recently and the sites she hasn't been to for a while so they go to one of the sites she's about due to visit and set up a hide they're there all day just scanning everywhere with the scope of the rifle and with their spotting scope they're taking turns back and forth on who's on the rifle who's on the spotting scope because being in the prone firing position is absolutely exhausting carlos has just been in the prone for about an hour and he goes to hand the rifle to jim him, and right as he hands the rifle to him they both have a hand on it apache and three of her snipers appear off in the distance both carlos and jim tense up not wanting okay. to let go of the rifle because both of them want to take this shot because it's personal this little tug of war ends up alerting apache and she disappears and the shot's gone both jim land Fuck. and carlos hathcock are embarrassed god damn it both of you now apache knows they're up but, but, but anyways i i shouldn't be swearing but i could understand come on out there hunting her but that's what she's wanted all along so they know that she's gonna come and try to out snipe them so they're gonna remove to a different hide where they're gonna have a look at their current hide and the area around it and try to spot her when she comes for them so they go they get their new hide set up and they're waiting all day they're scanning and they're waiting and somewhere along the line jim land calls into the artillery guys and gets them set up with the exact coordinates of this entire area that way if they do show up he's at least gonna cover this place with artillery shells and try to take Take him out that way and they keep waiting all day long and then right at dusk as the sun is about to go down completely they see five shadowy figures off in the distance of the wood line sneaking around but they're not sure it's them yet so they just continue to watch and then this crew starts stalking around going around the old location where hathcock and land were so this has to be them so they're waiting for a good shot they're waiting for a good shot and then one of the figures steps off to the side and squats down to do something maybe they're tying their shoe maybe they got to check the map something but jim land takes this opportunity to radio in and start dropping artillery on that location the first artillery shell lands literally seconds later these marines had this dialed in so close already and as the first shell lands that shadowy figure is still squatting down and carlos realizes that's got to be apache and she's squatting down to take a piss carlos realizes <laughs> this the second the first artillery round hits and when that happens apache stands up and starts sprinting away carlos follows her with his crosshairs gets a bead on her as she continues to run and he fires she collapses Car yeah! carlos immediately reloads the bolt on his winchester and fires again into her body as it lies lifeless on the ground three of the other figures have been taken down by the artillery and there's now just one man running away carlos immediately shifts over and fires on him dropping him as well after the artillery barrage stopped there was eerie silence as carlos and jim land approached their corpses they ended up recovering apache's sniper log proving that it was her later in life carlos said that his first shot at apache when she was running at a full sprint while artillery was going off all around him at dusk was the best shot he's ever made as it should be the most personal one guy in front of her was trying to get her to stop because they were running right to towards us where, we, where they'd seen us before <sighs> he's trying to get her to stop she didn't but i stopped her yeah. <laughs> well done sir well done put one extra for good measure because i that was the best shot I ever made, I think. Take that, Cobra. So Carlos Hathcock, Jim Land, and John Burke are all back on Hill 55. Things are kind of starting to slow down. I mean, they're still going out on missions. They're still doing Overwatch duty, but they're not having run-ins with any more main characters. You know, people with nicknames and prowess. It's just your typical anonymous bad guys, your Homer Hamburger type situations. Now, Carlos has been in theater for about 11 months. Remember, the first four was him being an MP guarding the front gate to a base, but the other seven months have been pretty fast-paced and non-stop the entire time. So in the next month or two, he should be heading back home to see his wife, Josephine, and he's 
ready for it. He's tired. He's been through an awful lot. At this point, he has about 86 confirmed kills and hundreds of probables that can't be confirmed because there wasn't an officer present to witness it. Then one day, out of the blue on Hill 55, a bunch of Force Recon Marines show up, but they're not acting like your normal Force Recon Marines. These guys show up. There's no pleasantries. There's no, hi, how are you? There's no introductions. My name's so-and-so. I'm from this unit. That Nothing. They show up and are like, are you Carlos Hathcock? And he's like, yeah. Yeah, that's me. And he's like, we need the best sniper around to go on a mission. I can't tell you what it is. I just need to know if you want to do it. This entire situation is weird. Carlos is thinking these guys got to be working for the CIA or some special operation that nobody knows about. Either way, he comes to the conclusion he has to be the one to go out on this mission because they're looking for the best sniper for a reason. Clearly, it's got to be extremely dangerous. And Carlos realizes that if he says no, they're just going to go to the next best guy. And if that next best guy isn't good enough to pull this off, Carlos is going to spend the rest of his life wondering that if he'd have gone on this mission maybe that guy would still be alive so carlos agrees to do it so they pull him in they brief him on this mission basically there's this man that they call the frenchman that these force recon marines have been stalking for months apparently after the french left vietnam and america took over the theater this guy stayed for some reason and he is now helping to run guns between the ussr and the Viet Cong. this group of guys whether they're force recon Mar ah that's cr crazy so hold on was he like a former french colonial or Something of that nature. Um, because if you ever see the film Apocalypse Now, there's a deleted scene where the boat crew actually runs into a family from France still living there. Marines or CIA or whatever they are have apparently been watching this guy for months, and this guy never leaves this French villa compound that he lives in. The problem is they don't know how to get in there and take him out. If they bomb the compound and he's got some type of bomb shelter in there that they don't know about and he ends up surviving, he's going to bounce and he's going to be gone forever and they can't have that. They also can't send in a small team to take him out because this guy has a ton of security patrolling around this compound 24-7 all day, every day. The only time they ever actually get visual confirmation that this guy is inside the compound is when he actually shows up to the front gate to meet with the Viet Cong that are either dropping off or picking up weapons because he doesn't like them coming inside the compound, so he at least shows his face at the the gate. So their thought is if they can get a sniper to take him out when he goes to the gate to meet the Viet Cong, that's going to be the best way to guarantee that this guy dies. But the problem with that is this villa is out in the middle of a grass field for like 800 yards in every single direction, meaning that the closest they're going to be able to get for a sniper is 800 yards away, which is really pushing the limits of what a sniper at this point in time can do, and they don't have anybody with them that can make that shot guaranteed. And this is where Carlos Hathcock comes in. So they give Carlos a topographical map, they tell him here's the locations that we can insert you with a helicopter. Here's the places that we can extract you. Here's the villa. You pick where you want to line up your shot. However you want to get this done, you tell us, we'll make it happen. Carlos is examining this map. He identifies a good spot that he thinks he's going to be able to get this shot off at the front gate. It's about 800 yards away from the gate. From there, they figure the entry point with the helicopter, the extraction point, they get the whole plan laid out. Him and John Burke are going in the very next morning. That night, Carlos spends quite a while memorizing the entire topographical map. He's going to know exactly where they're getting dropped off, exactly all the terrain features in the area that he needs to be able to identify to know where he's going, and exactly how to get from the point he takes a shot back to their extraction point and get out. He doesn't even need to bring the map with them because it is burned into his memory very next morning hathcock and burke jump inside this helicopter they get flown in they get inserted they get dropped off helicopter takes off these guys start sneaking their way through this wood line making their way to where they got to line up this shot it takes them a couple hours but they finally make their way up to this big dirt mound right on the edge of the wood line they get set up they get their shots lined up they're looking right at the front of this gate there's patrols going around but these guys are 800 yards away from this front gate they're fine they're just waiting okay watching and observing all day long watching for hours you know by the way i'm really enjoying these nicknames you got cobra apache and now the frenchman and hours and hours sure enough a convoy of cars comes rolling up the road towards this gate they stop at the gate a bunch of dudes get out it's the Viet Cong, and they're waiting at the gate and sure enough this massive french guy comes walking out in a white button-up shirt this dude's well over six feet tall at this point carlos okay. is thinking you know this is an 800 yard shot we're really pushing the limits of when i can guarantee i'm gonna hit but this guy's doing everything he can to make it easy for me wearing that nice white button-up shirt he literally looks like a silhouette paper target that he's used to shooting back home at the range not only that but because he's so tall he is head and shoulders above all these Viet Cong guys and as soon as he stops walking around and stops to talk at the guy in charge Carlos lines up his shot takes it and just folds the guy in half one shot one kill Hathcock and Burke slide down the reverse side of the mound and start making their way back to the extraction point 
The Viet Cong and the guards have no idea what just happened. They don't even know where the shot came from. They're panicked, freaking out, running around. And Carlos and Burke make their getaway back to the helicopter, get picked up, get flown back to Hill 55, get dropped off. And they're like, cool, thanks. Get the fuck out of my helicopter and just ditch them. So now Hathcock and Burke are back at the hill like, this is a weird day. Like, they didn't say thank you. They didn't debrief. I was like, all right, now fuck off. Logan Roy style. Brief him, nothing. They just asked if the dude's dead. Carlos is like, yep, he's dead. They dropped him off, and that was the end of it. There's no, like, we'll be in touch. We'll talk to you soon. Carlos doesn't even know any of these guys' names. They just dropped him off and bounced. What the hell just happened? Now, Carlos doesn't know this at the time, and honestly, he may have never found out because the government didn't even admit that this existed until the late 1990s, but everything about this sounds like Mac V. Sog. If you don't know, at this point in time during Vietnam, America has this ultra-secret special forces group known as Mac V. Sog, and it is comprised of the very best Army Green Berets, Navy SEALs, and Force Recon Marines available, and their job is to covertly go into neutral territories like Cambodia and Laos, because the North Vietnamese army is using these neutral countries to smuggle supplies all the way down deep into South Vietnam. So they are going into ah. Cambodia and Laos as well in small man teams trying to stop them. Now, to be completely fair and intellectually honest, I can't prove this, but everything adds up. And I think that Carlos Hathcock just got picked up by some Mac V SOG guys flown into either Laos or Cambodia without him even knowing, conducted a covert operation inside of a neutral country to help stop the supply chain of supplies getting funneled into South Vietnam to help the Viet Cong. The time period, location, and mission set lines up exactly with what Mac V SOG was doing at the time, and this would explain why they were so secretive and didn't tell Carlos what exactly he was doing or where he was doing it. The general. Back home on Hill 55, some time passes and everything's just regular. It's normal. Wake up, go to battle with Homer Hamburger, go to bed, and repeat. This goes on for about a month, and then, sure enough, the recon marine slash CIA slash Mac V Sog, whatever the fuck these guys are, they show back up again asking for Carlos Hathcock. Pretty much the same exact thing happens. No pleasantries, no hi, how are you, no introductions, doesn't know anybody's name, just hey. We got a dangerous mission. You're the best man for the job. Do you want it or not? And at this point, Carlos Hathcock is three weeks away from going home to his wife, Josephine. Absolutely nobody would blame him if he did not want to go out on this top secret, extremely dangerous mission with this weird special forces group that nobody knows who they are. But again, Carlos knows that if he doesn't accept this mission, they're just going to go to the next guy. And that guy isn't as good as Carlos Hathcock. And he just can't live with that. Carlos accepts the mission. Okay, they take him in. They brief him on what's going on. It's basically the exact same mission as when he killed the Frenchman, except now it's even harder. This time it's an NVA general. He's living inside of this French villa that's kind of tucked up right by the wood line overlooking this enormous grass field. And the dudes briefing Carlos are like, this field is like 2000 yards long. There's no terrain features to get the high ground. There's nowhere to even get a shot close. So obviously you're going to have to shoot from the wood line. The problem with that is they're patrolling around this compound 24 seven all day and night and they're using dogs. So even if you can get close enough to take the shot, they're going to start looking for you and hunt you down with dogs after the fact and then you're really going to have a problem you're probably not going to make it out of this carlos is immediately like i'm not taking the shot from that wood line i'm taking the shot from that grass field and the advisors are like what <laughs> what are you talking about to which carlos is like that's the last place they'd expect it to come from so that's where it has to come from i want you go get him carlos your fourth main boss the final boss the general you guys to drop me off way over here on the other end of the map i'll go through these woods and then i'm gonna low crawl for three days moving one foot an hour until i can clear 1200 yards to get within 800 yards of this villa and then i'm gonna take the shot and hopefully sneak away to which the advisors are like i mean Sounds crazy to me, but you're the expert. We came to you for a reason. If that's how you want to do it, go ahead and get it done. Go ahead and grab your boy, John Burke. You guys get ready. You're going out first thing in the morning, at which point Carlos informs him he's going out alone on this one. It's too dangerous and moving that far through that grass field. He needs to be as small as physically possible. So Carlos goes back to his tent, grabs everything he needs. He grabs one canteen of water, a little bit of food, his rifle and his Colt 1911 for a backup weapon. And for the first time since he found it, he leaves the white feather there because he doesn't have any else there with him to protect and he wants every advantage he can get from there he goes gets in the helicopter they fly him there insert him exactly okay. where he wanted to be drop him off right at dusk he maneuvers through the wood line gets to this field by nighttime and starts low crawling all night long 
And there's still patrols all night long. They're going around with spotlights, walking around. But Carlos only brought one canteen of water because he wanted one canteen on one hip. And he's not just going to crawl belly down this entire time. He's going to crawl on his side to leave as small of a trail as possible. Carlos is making himself so small and he's moving so slowly under the cover of night that they would literally have to step right on top of him to be able to find him. And according to Carlos, they almost did on several occasions. They got within arm's reach. Fortunately for Carlos, every time the patrols got close, he could hear them goofing off or not taking this job very seriously because he knew that they knew nobody in their right mind would ever try to attack that villa from this enormous field that's being covered by patrols. They'd be coming from that other wood line. So the enemy's guard is down and they're not being very diligent, which is exactly what Carlos wanted. At this point, he starts getting a little bit more confidence that he's actually going to pull this off. Carlos crawls all night long. He makes it four, 500 yards in. And then as the sun comes up, his strategy is to just lay there, not moving. Try to sleep the best of his ability while still being alert. And he just doesn't want to move at all. It's too risky in daylight. So that's what he does. He lays there motionless all day long. When the patrols go by and he knows he can get away with it, he'll take a sip of water. Maybe he tries to eat a tiny bit of food. Otherwise, he's just laying there. So obviously this sucks, but the plan is it's supposed to suck. So everything's actually going great. But by lunchtime, a a vulture or whatever the Vietnamese equivalent of a vulture in this part of the world no! starts circling overhead above Hathcock. To which Carlos is like, shit, what do I do? Do I just keep laying here and let it keep circling? Like, it's not going to get the balls to come up and try to eat me. I should be fine that way. But then he realizes it's a bunch of army dudes with their guard down. And if they see a vulture circling, one of those dumbasses might just be like, hey, let's go see what animals dying in the field that that vulture sees. So Carlos has to figure out a way to get this vulture to quit circling overhead. Now he wishes he could just shoot the fucking thing, but obviously that's not an option. So the, literally the only thing he can do to try to get this vulture off of his trail is to start moving slowly again, but now it's in the daylight. So it's extremely dangerous, but at least he's still pretty far away and he's not up close. So maybe nobody will notice. So that's what he does. He starts inching along again in the daylight, hoping this vulture fucks off. And eventually it does. By then it's nighttime again. Carlos again crawls all night long. Stupid freaking bird. But hey, respect birds after all. And yes, birds are real. They are the great descendants of Tyrannosaurus Rex. So when you're eating chicken... That's T Rex, great, 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 long clearing hundreds of more yards by the time the sun comes up the next day he's made it a total of somewhere between 900 and a thousand yards in meaning he only needs to go three to two hundred more before he can finally get that 800 yard shot luckily there's no vultures circling overhead today unfortunately he is now being eaten alive by fire ants ah! in addition to that he's out of water he's out of food he's dehydrated he's hungry and he's just laying in this if you've been bit by fire ants you know what that feels like field dressed like a bush getting baked alive by the sun while fire ants are trying to eat him and this is the hardest part of the entire mission the mental game the suffering of knowing that he's 1100 yards at most away from his target and he's taken shots that far before and landed them he knows that in theory he could take this shot right now and it could all be over and he could just go back home and get some water some food and get these fucking fire ants off of him at that distance he could make it but he can't guarantee it. So he lays there and just continues to suffer the entire day until that night when he advances forward another three to 400 yards. Somewhere between seven and 800 yards away, he finds this tiny little elevation, this little itty bitty hump of dirt that doesn't even appear on topographical maps. It's so small and he gets on top of it. And this is going to be where he takes his shot from. The next day he's watching with a scope, trying to figure out who the general is and get ready to take this shot. And after a while, he starts to figure out a lot of these guys keep going. <laughs> Uh, fat boy going back to the same person and that same guy keeps pointing and then these dudes keep going and doing whatever he's pointing at so clearly that's got to be the man in charge that's the general Carlos gets ready to line up his shot. His bubble of concentration starts forming. He no longer cares that he's dehydrated. He's tired. He's hungry. He has a bunch of fire ant bites. The only thing that exists in the world right now is his crosshairs, his trigger finger, and where that bullet's going in that general's chest. He takes his shot. He racks another round into the gun immediately in case he has to have a follow-up shot because he missed. And as he re-racks it and his scope re-centers on the general, he sees him collapse to the ground dead as he's watching this unfold his bubble of concentration finally bursts as an alarm starts going off and he realizes oh shit this mission isn't over yet and i gotta get out of here Yo! so as he's about to slide down the backside of this elevation he's on he looks 
and sees that all of the guards and patrols are running the other direction into the wood line because that's obviously where a sniper would be hiding. Carlos's plan worked. Carlos. Brilliant, Carlos. Now run, boy, run. Crawls as fast as he can, gets out of this field, makes it back to the wood line, goes all the way to where Come he's on. supposed to have the rendezvous point. But because Carlos had spent the first day crawling as well, he'd taken this shot a lot earlier than anybody had anticipated. So now he's just got to wait. That's the only option. So he finds himself a nice little hide, conceals himself as good as he can, and he takes a nap until the helicopters wake him up when they get there. Same exact thing as last time. They pick him up in the helicopter. Did you get the guy? He's like, yep, I got him. Cool. Thanks, I guess. Take him back to Hill 55K. Get the fuck out of my helicopter. Still doesn't even know who these guys are. Fuck! This story is also made up and completely ridiculous because... No, it's not. It's all true. Carlos never knew the name of the general, and the NVA never reported that they lost a general at this point in time. Fuck! Okay, one, never trust enemy documentation, especially if they're communist, and double that doubt if it's a lack of documentation that you're referring to. And two, if this was a MACV SOG mission, which I'm fairly confident it was, it meant that Carlos was flown into Laos or Cambodia, not even realizing it, to take this shot, which means the NVA weren't going to report that they lost a general inside of a neutral territory that they weren't supposed to be inside of anyways, similar to how the US government never reported losing MACV SOG operatives inside of Laos and Cambodia. And because governments would never lie. Governments would never lie. And again, to be completely intellectually honest, I cannot stress this enough. I can't prove that this was a MACV SOG mission. I tried for like a year. But humor me, let's take two seconds and just Google it. Mac v. Sog Operation 1967, the exact same year that this supposedly went down. Mac v. Sog led a mission to eliminate Vietnam's top general by going behind enemy lines. That's suspicious. Well said, Cardi B. Okay, I can't prove it, but if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. But if you still doubt it, you should consult an expert and maybe see if they think it's a duck and we can do that too. Okay, all the interviews we have recorded of Carlos Hathcock discussing all of this, those interviews were conducted by a man by the name of John Plaster, who was a Mac V SOG operative in the same theater at the same time that became a sniper and then wrote like 15 books about being a sniper. On top of that, Jim Land, you know, his commanding officer and also a world-renowned sniper was in multiple interviews after the fact and also never cast any doubt on anything Carlos said ever. So just so we're all on the same page, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and none of the experts at hand doubt its duckliness. It's probably a fucking duck. Quack, quack. Shoot the duck, shoot the duck. <laughs> well. Daffy, that's what you get for being stupid. I'm sorry, I'm getting sidetracked and angry. Anyways, so Carlos is back at Hill 55. Basically, at this point, he's got a couple more days of duty, and then it's time for him to pack his shit up and go back home to America. He's home for about a year, and then he gets sent back to Vietnam again in 1969. Now, over the last couple of years, and in part due to Carlos Hathcock himself, being a scout sniper has become much more well-known and much more respected. Because of that, the Marine Corps is actually starting to get scout sniper equipment, and Carlos isn't going to have to do his second deployment with a civilian hunting rifle. He gets issued a Remington 700, chambered in 308, racks up a couple couple more confirmed kills, bringing his total to 93 confirmed by that ridiculous confirmation criteria with somewhere between three and 400 probables. Then one day. Well, that's a lot. He gets ready to go out on a mission, does his favorite strategy of linking up with an infantry unit. And then as they move along, at some point, he's going to peel off and go do his own thing. And on this particular occasion, he hops inside of an Amtrak because they were mechanized. They're going along. It's an ordinary day. They're bullshitting inside the Amtrak, you know, just doing what guys do. And then all of a sudden... The Amtrak drove over a mine and blew up and the entire thing is now going up in flames. Carlos is literally on fire and the other seven Marines are worse off than him as he starts dragging them outside of this flaming Amtrak one at a time. He gets all seven of them out, gets himself out, collapses, still on fire, and then a Navy corpsman from one of the other Amtraks runs out 
and I don't know how, but they said that he used water from either a puddle or a nearby pond to put Carlos out. Carlos is burnt to a crisp. They medevac him out of there. He goes through the whole medical system, makes his way back to Brookfield Medical Center. From there, he has to get skin grafts using his skin, whatever's left of it, other people's skin, animal skin. Because of the water they use to put the fire out, he ends up getting this weird fungal infection that he's got to battle. And then he ends up getting a bunch of different types of staph infections. Then he ends up getting pneumonia. And by the time he fights all these infections, tries to heal from his burns, he's down to 97 pounds. He's in the hospital at Brookfield Medical Center from September of 1969 until January of 1970 and on January 5th he walks out and returns to active duty. From there he went on to continue to build and instruct the Marine Corps Scout Sniper Program that expanded into law enforcement and other branches of the U.S. military. He helped create what we know today as modern sniping. Health wise he never fully recovered. He was always wearing white cotton undergarments, a long sleeve shirt and long sleeve pants because his grafted skin was so sensitive that the military uniform would actually chafe it and cause it to bleed. Despite that, he still continued to train the next generation of snipers until in 1975 when he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And again, despite that, he managed to hang on for four more years of active duty, continuing to be an instructor. After his retirement in 1979, he became a contractor consulting for the U.S. military and law enforcement agencies for sniping, obviously. He also, at this point in time, picked up a new hobby of going shark fishing because why not? He's Carlos Hathcock, that's why. Then in the 1980s, somebody writes a book about him called Marine Sniper 93 Confirmed Kills. This book is incredibly popular. Carlos goes from being a legend inside of the Marine Corps and the US military to being probably the most famous and well-known sniper in the world. And at this point, people start asking questions like, well, why doesn't this guy have like a bunch of high ranking medals or the Medal of Honor? Or like why he seems like he's been underappreciated for what he's done. So Jim Land, his commanding officer and a bunch of other people came out of the woodwork to testify to these award committees that Carlos should be getting the Medal of Honor for all the incredible things that he's done. The problem is, is he was in an experimental unit and they were busy. Nobody was trying to get awards at the time. They were trying to do a job. So there wasn't a ton of documentation. And the other issue, in my opinion, he may or may not have been unknowingly doing operations for Mac V SOG, which at this point in time is still super top secret and the government hasn't admitted even exists yet. And you see this a lot from people from that era not getting the awards that they actually earned because they were a place that the government said they weren't when they earned that award. You have war heroes like Roy Benavidez who earned the Medal of Honor and didn't get it until 15 years after the fact because he was in Cambodia on a Mac V SOG operation when it happened. So this award appeals process gets drug out for years and by 1996, Carlos Hathcock is diagnosed with Parkinson's in combination to his burns, in combination to his MS, he ends up being bound to a wheelchair. In that same year of 1996, he was also retroactively awarded a silver star for his courageous actions of dragging those other Marines out of the burning Amtrak. His other incredibly heroic acts would go unrewarded, and in 1999, three years later, he would pass away due to medical complications at the age of 56. So in conclusion, oh, that is a story- God, no. Still very young. of white feather carlos hathcock the greatest sniper of all time thank you for watching best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over the fatelectrician.com quack bang out all right for every item purchased out of my merch store for the month of august 2024 you're gonna automatically gonna get one entry to win this custom steelhead outdoors locking cabinet uh it's pretty awesome you can put guns whatever else you wanted inside of it inside's pretty dope too as you can see cheese I fucking knew it i knew he had the connection to the cheese he's got the cheese all of it oh well this will not stand it's a lot of cheese though man it's kind of making me hungry it's a lot of cheese but uh, yeah, every single item, doesn't matter if it's a koozie, a sticker, a shirt, sweater, any item is one entry automatically. And then there's a free way to enter over on bunkerbranding.com. You can get all the links and everything over the fatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. There you go. Would you like to be remembered? A little pork roast. <laughs> 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 Uh, that's an Arkansas man, you know? That's it. When you're, uh, when you're gone, how would you like to be uh, looked at or remembered? you like your legacy? Just that I did a good job. I did a good job. That's all I want.
I told him, you recognize there's somebody, Marine, trying to do it. Yeah, that's right, Marines, all the way. First of all, Fat Electrician, 10 out of 10, life-changing video. Number two, this was a work of art. And if it took you this long to make this video, on behalf of the entire Marine Corps, and no, I can't speak for all of them, but I think I could say, I think a lot of them would agree with me. Thank you for giving the honor and respect to Carlos Hathcock, who was by far the greatest of the snipers. And you know what? I can't hold a candle to the guy, but he cared about one thing, and that was the mission. And taking care of his brothers and doing a good job. And Fat Electrician, you did a fantastic job giving him the respect that he was due. And also uh, reenacting the correct shot of how he took out Cobra. I was unaware of this situation with Apache and the Frenchman. I've heard the story about Cobra, and I've heard the story about ge the general, but never about the other two. But that man is a legend. And, you know, we all make an impact in life. But Carlos Hathcock, he, he's forever going to be remembered. Well done. Well done indeed. And so... I actually got a special request, actually. Now, the Fat Electrician has commented on some of our videos in the past. And so, I ask for the Fat Electrician, if and when. It doesn't have to be today, or tomorrow, or next year. I have a request. So, there was a TV series back in the day when I was young. I liked it. It first aired on NBC on September 23rd, 1976 until April 6, 1978. Baba Black Sheep. And it has to basically deal with the Marine Corps Squadron, the World War II Squadron in the South Pacific. Uh, the Marine Fighter Attack Squadron 214. And uh, those, 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 those guys were the best. And the reason why I'm asking is because one of my favorite fighter planes from War Thunder, the F4U, F4U Corsair, one of my personal favorites, was used. And I'm wondering if he would ever consider doing that, if and when he should choose so. No time limit, no nothing. But it would, it would be, hey, DJ, I got a request. Um, but all in all, this was a fantastic video. Um, well done. And you know what I noticed too? Not a single mention of a crayon joke. You knew better because the ghost of Carlos Hascock would have, would have found you <laughs> until then folks. Uh, things have been going pretty well. Uh, cause I saw a couple people message in, in some previous videos like, Hey, are you okay? I'm doing great folks. Please take good care of yourselves and each other. Much love, and I'll see all of you on the flip side. Peace, and uh, keep your heads on a swivel. And remember, remember the name, White Feather, a.k.a. Carlos Hascock.